One of the things I suppose that most people starting an aesthetic clinic get concerned about is complications. And obviously the two things that you will be using will be botulinum toxin and hyaluronic acid. There are other derma fillers, but probably we focus on hyaluronic acid, its potential problems and what can change. Before you do anything, probably what you need is an anaphylaxis kit. Particularly, this is for nurses, dentists and doctors who have remote clinics. They may have a clinic in Manchester and another in Birmingham. And it's very easy to get into the car, bring all your supplies of Azalur or Emerville with you, but forget to bring this. I suppose the most important part of the kit, from our point of view, is the potential for uh, vascular occlusion, and that would be Hyalase. In Britain and Ireland, we tend to use this particular one that comes from Woodford. It's 1,500 units. It has a lot of side effects that we'll go into later on. Um, in America, we prefer um, Hyaluron Desmid genetically, which is 10 times um, less units than this so they often have to use five or six different ampules where we have to use one as i say this is from sheep's testicles so as a consequence it has the potential to cause anaphylaxis so if we look first at anaphylaxis um most doctors and dentists will know that your best friend during any sort of anaphylaxis is adrenaline normally we would give this as one in a thousand intramuscularly repeat do it um, until we have um, some resolution. That's a mild or moderate anaphylaxis. Obviously in severe shock, you need to get your unconscious patient left lateral position and use an appropriate oral airway. And usually there'll be oral airways in all of the anaphylaxis kits. Mm -hmm. So if we look first at hyaluronidase, you can see this is made by Woodford. It's 1500 international units. Now, when I used this first, and I approached um, the product from a certain company to um, what level we should use, they'd never used it in their life. Believe it or not, this is back 2004, 2005. Because nobody had, I suppose, used it per se, but of course now we use bacteriostatic saline. And bacteriostatic saline, um, is good because it doesn't cause us any pain. If you go to UCLA, it really is painful. And a lot of people, when they used it originally, as a consequence, added lidocaine. We started using bacteriostatic saline probably over 10 years ago, and this almost makes it painless. By the way, if you ever run out of this, and there was a situation in England last year where people were out of it for six months, common sense would say, all you need to do is buffer it with 10 to 1 sodium bicarbonate and becomes painless again. A lot of people don't realize that saline obviously physiologically can cause pain and whenever you're using lidocaine, the reason that lidocaine is painful is because there's hydrochloric acid in it. Hydrochloric acid is used as a preservative so I'll put this here as well. So if you notice, what I have here now is xylocaine or lidocaine on its own, and here it is with adrenaline. Now this is important from the point of view that obviously if you are using hyaluronidase with a potential for it to cause anaphylaxis, obviously there's adrenaline in this. So if you mix it with adrenaline, you're not going to technically have a problem, just to be aware of that. I don't like advocating the use of lidocaine with adrenaline, particularly in terms of vascular occlusion. Somebody may mistakenly use adrenaline at the same time and make the ischemia worse because it'll cause vasoconstriction. So if we assume for the moment that we have got some hyaluronidase, what I tend to do is the following. The first thing that I do is take a syringe that we normally use for botulinum toxin. And these syringes can be, this one here is 29G. Obviously it's less painful if we use, for instance, these that are 30G and even ones up to 32G. But in this instance, I'm using a 29 gauge syringe just because it makes it easier to draw up the bacteriostatic saline. So, what we do is 
drop a mill of your bacteriostatic saline. And then I take my hyaluronidase and I add the mill to it. I know it's different than most people do, but it makes total common sense to me. So then what you can do is draw up whatever you want of this. If you remember, you now have 1,500 units per mil. So if I draw up not 0.5, and then it hasn't touched the patient yet. Be careful if you're using this because you're going to be introducing potentially hyaluronidase back in. So if I draw in more bacteriostatic saline, that means my 0.5 has 750 units. So if now I use this, each 0.1 is 75 units. And that's where you want to be, 75 units for doing anything. So that's the simplest way. That means you're only putting two mils in it, and particularly for a vascular occlusion, 75 by 10, 750 units, you probably want to do that twice a day. During a vascular occlusion, <clears throat> obviously the body fights to try and get blood into the area that has been compromised. So the first thing you're going to get is what they call reticular formation, where the whole area turns red and then later purple. And don't forget, this is just the blood vessels in the area dilating up to try and get blood into the area itself. Now, there's a lot of, I suppose, controversy as to what we should do whenever that happens. I would say every place that you see the reticular formation that you would inject. So if, for instance, I take this diagram and we have got a patient who has got a vascular occlusion in the region of the iliar artery, don't be surprised if it runs all the way up into the forehead. People think, oh my God, superorbital, supertrochlear artery, they come from the internal um, carotid artery and as a consequence this is really a severe deterioration. Most of the vascular compromises I see will have the forehead involved as well. So this is not unusual. What you're trying to do is to an extent prevent monocular blindness. <clears throat> I've had two cases referred to me that of blindness and if that happens, what I tend to do is treat. So most of the vascular compromise you're going to see are a consequence of inadvertent embolism of the facial artery as it makes its way up here over the bottom of the mandible. Now the facial vein obviously runs much more superior. The facial artery runs right underneath the muscles to make its way into the inferior and superior labial artery, into the alveolar artery, dorsal nasal, all the way back up. So you probably going to see compromise of this area and above it. Even though we know that when you pull back your syringe you get some retrograde flow, it would be unusual to have a compromise of the vascular etiology of the iliar artery and still see problems proximal to that. It will usually be distal all the way further up. If you see it under the forehead, don't worry, don't get excited. Now this is where some tips and tricks come in. For instance, that I tend to do, I mean the first thing you've got to realise what is happening. The vessel is blocked, so as a consequence one of three things is going to happen. The first thing is if the vessel is blocked you may be able to free it. So if you get the um, patient and just rub them in the area and massage them directly you may disimpact the insult to the, um, the artery or the vasculature. The second thing is, if you get some swabs, um, I find that these are of benefit, and um, you put them in the microwave with some um, saline, warm compresses will sort of work also. The third thing is, most of these things don't happen at the time, they happen later. Now, if they happen at the time, you're going to get blanching, you're going to get pain, and you're going to get some level of compromise that the patient knows. 
The problem is because most of the products, like this wrestling product here, would have lidocaine on board already. And with lidocaine on board already, the patient may not feel any pain at all. But most problems I've seen, believe it or not, seem to happen a day or two later. Which makes us wonder what is happening in terms of whether it's a venous or an arterial structure. I know, and a lot of plastic surgeons will tell me, that if you put your finger on top of the uh, facial artery, it'll still keep pulsatile in an anatomical specimen. So they're saying that usually the vein could not be part of this compromise. This is what we call the hose pipe theory, and it's been around since about 2004, 2005. I have a different theory that I call myself the roundabout theory, and I, I compare it to a roundabout. If you've got cars that block the exit out of a roundabout, then nothing can go into it, just from a logical point of view. So I myself, I'm suspect, and I'm not saying that this is um, validated, that hyaluronic acid itself in a dermal filler, whenever it swells up, when it becomes hydrophilic, it may compromise the venous structure. Of course, there is another possibility, and that is that a partial embolization by hyaluronic acid of the vascular network may start platelet aggregation, and as a consequence, that it happens at a later date because the platelets are involved. And this is the reason that aspirin, uh, acetylsalicylic acid, is added as one of the mixtures. Now, I myself, I'm a bit ambiguous about it because if you're using high hyaluronidase along with aspirin, you're probably going to end up with one hell of a bruise. So suddenly it's very hard to tell the difference between what is vascular compromise and what is actually a bruise. Now, the problem is that uh, I, I sat on one or two Facebook forums and at the best of times, a lot of physicians and nurses are, are confused, actually, is this an embolus or is it not? So whenever you see something that could be either, and the two can look the same, and I've seen many cases that, you know, doctor colleagues of mine, and dentists and nurses, have all mistaken which one is it. So if you're dealing with a bruise and you can't tell the difference and you suddenly add in hyaluronidase and you add in aspirin, you're going to end up with a hell of a bruise. And I have some wonderful pictures where patients have got blue-black uh, bruises as a consequence. Now, nobody minds you over-treating a patient because you're going to be in a situation where if you don't do something, this person may end up with necrosis and scarring of her face look at people will get over bruises it's not the end of the world so you're probably better if you aren't sure to go ahead and treat it as a potential vascular occlusion and often you're going to be on your own it'll be a saturday a patient will ring you you could be in birmingham sheffield dublin and you're on your own and so you're better i think over treating now one of the things i do sometimes is i say okay i've got 75 units here what I'm going to do is, I suppose, get rid of some of this and, as a consequence, add in lidocaine. And if I add in lidocaine, then I have got, again, the saline with it, and the lidocaine will not only reduce the potential for pain, but it will also work as a vasodilator. Now, in terms of vasodilators, there's a lot of controversy out there at the moment. People say you should not use nitro paste. I don't like nitro paste anyway, but my, my own reasons for not liking it. The first thing is it causes syncopal episodes. And I've seen syncopal episodes where patients post vascular occlusion have had to be sent to hospital because the patient or their friends think that it's a deterioration in physiological status, but it is just the nitro paste that has caused them to sort of pass out in a syncopal episode. Now, one of the reasons we don't use it or has been taken off the list is that it causes paradoxical hyperemia. And what um, has been shown in rabbit's ears in some demonstrable studies, both from Sweden and the United States, that um, if you add in nitro paste, it is possible you can cause peripheral vasodilation around the embolus, and as a consequence, the embolus further impacts distally down the line. Now, I haven't used, I suppose, nitropaste since 2011, um, mainly because of the fact that, as I said, it causes sinkable episodes, but also you have to put it on every 30 minutes to an hour. 
and the patient's going to have this problem in the middle of their sleep. They can't be waking up all the time to sort of, you know, use topical uh, nitrates. So I advocated the use of oral nitrates then. Sinetophil, as Viagra, Cialis. I like Cialis. It worked for 48 hours. It works even when um, you have alcohol on board. And as a consequence, it works during the night time. It isn't FDA approved for women. And of 79 cases, I had one problem in Germany where a person had a type of nausea and vomiting reaction after it. But in most cases, I find that it's fine. Now, you could turn around theoretically and say, well, Dr. Tracy, if you're not advocating the use of, or, um, of topical nitrates, how do you know that oral nitrates don't do the same thing? And the answer is, I don't know. I have the experience of treating, oh, maybe short of 100 vascular occlusions over a period of 10 years or more. And um, in my sort of um, experience with it, um, I have had very few, if any, um, vascular occlusions that have ended up with scarring. Now, one of the things I advocate also is the use of hyperbaric oxygen chambers. These are in every city, you know? People phone me and say, is there one in London? Yeah, there's about 20 in London. Is there one in Manchester? There are three in Manchester. There's some in Huddersfield, there's some in Leeds. I'm just going back over the case we've had over the last year or two. And um, hyperbaric oxygen, some plastic surgeons and colleagues of mine may quite rightly say, all evidence points towards the fact that if you have got ischemia, that hyperbaric oxygen chambers don't seem to show much. But if you look at the research behind that, it's mostly got to do with orthopedics. And we know that if you have a patient with um, an intermedullary neck of femur fracture, that it doesn't tend to work there. But it's much easier, if you consider, for hyperbaric oxygen to force oxygen into compromised skin epithelium and dermal tissues than it is bone matrix. So I don't think enough evidence has been done, probably the fault of people like myself that are dealing with this on a daily basis and aren't right writing up our research. But if you consider the fact that what is wrong is you have got no oxygen going to the tissues, you have a buildup of lactic acid, and as a consequence of buildup of lactic acid, you have got extreme pain, you're going to get um, destruction of the tissue, well, it only makes common sense that if you can force oxygen into the tissues, that the, it will absorb in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber. If you're going to use a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, I'd advocate probably to use it at about 75% first, um, rather than 100%, because particularly in wintertime, patients may have some fluid in their ears, and as a consequence, you can blow their eardrums. So if you, I suppose, put the patient under it for 30 minutes to 100 um, 30 minutes to um, an hour, 60 minutes at 75, and then make your way up to 100%. Uh, in my experience, the patient just needs five treatments. And um, as I say, I've, in, in the last few years, seen almost nobody end up with, with scarring. Most of these conditions, believe it or not, will get better. Your best friend is hyaluronidase by far, and the use of hyaluronidase um, within a sort of wonderful eight hour time period usually reverse both. I have used hyaluron days eight days later um, and it has give 100% effect also. People say that when you make it up it sort of um, stops working then. Believe it or not I always have it on standby because I use so much of it. That's hyaluron days. Some of that is two weeks old, four weeks old and I find it works fine. The one thing that you would have to do is that if you look at it when you have it, I suppose, left over a period of time, it tends to go white in the bottom and that's just the saline evaporating out of it. And um, if somebody comes into me, for instance, because this is like 400 pounds a box, you know, and if somebody comes in and they just need a little bit of um, hyaluronidase because of overfill, now, obviously there are sterility issues in what I'm saying regarding this, but if it's somebody that just needs a little bit, I often sort of keep it and it, and it works fine. Now, if you are using hyaluron days for vascular occlusion, use a new one every time. It's a totally different thing than I get sent so many patients, sometimes two or three a day, that just need a little bit of hyalase taken out of a lip or something. And that's what I often do. I've never had a problem with it. Um, everybody has their own ways of doing things 
and obviously there's sterility issues there. But if you're opening a new one of those for every patient you're treating, and um, there seems to be more and more patients, um, that's just, I suppose, my way of doing it. So I have lidocaine in this, so lidocaine will work as a vasodilator. Now, just think for a moment that I have got, again, a patient with an overfill, I can use xylocaine with adrenaline. Now, because I'm a bit short of it, I'm not going to go in to draw it up. Um, and having adrenaline on board, in my mind, may reduce the possibility of anaphylaxis. So, if you've got a patient that you're using for the first time um, with high um, uronidase, the first thing you've got to find out is, are they allergic to bee stings? Uh, a patient who's allergic to bee stings is also allergic to high urondes. We have a consent form, but sign a consent form that the patient may be aware, for instance, that it causes anaphylaxis. So what we normally do is take about 20 units and inject them on their arm. And um, you just set up a little bleb. I'm sure I could almost do it myself. I'm not gonna use high urondes, obviously, but I could use a bit of bacteriostatic saline and bacteriostatic saline will be your control. So if you are doing this, that's just pure bacteriostatic saline. And um, get a little swab. Alcohol swabs, I suppose, you have to be careful of to inactivate some compounds, but I'll just use it in terms of myself. It's not difficult to do. So if you put in a little bleb like this here and you write up around it that would we'll say this is your normal saline control and we we'll say write normal saline on one and just beside it put a bleb we we'll say of hyaluronides 20 units leave the patient for probably 10 to 20 minutes and if they don't have a reaction then you can go ahead with the use of the hyaluronic